this league, Heist got some pretty massive changes. With the new Transfigured Gems, there wasn't really a need to have alt qualities. Although I missed some of them, they probably needed to go. And with this, Heist lost basically its main money generator. So there needed to be some changes done if the mechanic wanted to exist in the future. So GGG revamped pretty much everything about the rewards with Heist. All blueprints now have the same items at the end, and the items at the end share from a pool of basically whatever was left when they removed unusual gems. However, this came with some new replicas, a couple of revamped amounts, say, of like divines and such that could drop, and one of the biggest changes was the new reworked high spaces. Some of them, which when unsplit, can cost more than a mirror for just the base. And since I'm one of the few people that puts together full content for Heist, I figured I'd go ahead and do the work and see how the new Heist fares. And the short of it is that Heist is still pretty insanely profitable, however, consistent profits aren't as good anymore, and it really is giant bursts of currency. In this video, we're going to go over my dedicated Heist build that I use for running contracts as well as blueprints. We'll go over some basics of how to gear your rogues, how to level up your rogues, tips for running Heists in general, as well as three to four specific specific strategies that you can use on anywhere from very low investment to absolutely insane investment when you're running different kinds of heist content. So if you're new to the channel, make sure that you subscribe and without further ado, let's get into it. So before we begin, I think it's important to give you a pretty large disclaimer. The whole purpose of this guide is to show you what I have found to be the most efficient way to run Heist. I'm going to be talking about various strategies. However, for this currency video, I am not guaranteeing any amount of divines per hour, mainly because it varies heavily with Heist now. You can get insane drops like this simplex amulet here, which is worth 800 plus divines at the moment. You can also get ones like this focused amulet, which with a non-split base is going to be like 280 to 300 divines. There's other bases that are going to be worth like 12 divine, 8 to 12 divine or so, and other various things. However, the base currency per hour may be relatively low depending on the strategy that you're running. That being said, you can make lots of money in Heist, just don't expect it to be super consistent, like if I do one hour, I'm going to make 10 divine kind of currency. Now, with all of that out of the way, Heist did end up being quite profitable for me. In the amount of time that I spent on it, I did get absolutely insanely lucky. I found a focused amulet, I found a simplex amulet, I found two micro distillery belts, a whole bunch of other bases, as well as a bunch of other stuff as well. And when we put everything together, I probably made anywhere from like 30 to 50 divine per hour with the amount of time that I spent. But once again, I got insanely lucky. So heist is profitable, but the way that I would say most likely is your best use case for doing heist is that you set up the heist strategy and run heist until you get one of the big lottery ticket items and then just stop. Because if you found something like a focus amulet or a simplex amulet, that's probably all the currency that you're going to need for the rest of the league if you're any kind of standard type player. If you're someone who plays all three or four months of the league and pushes like six different builds, yeah, one of these isn't going to be enough, but you can probably go magic find or something in affliction right now. So let's talk a little bit about the basics of heist. So when you get to, I think it's around act six is when you first get access to this, you're able to enter the rogues harbor. You'll need to do a couple of quests with Karai and some of the other rogues to unlock them. And around this time, people start to get a little bit frustrated because they're like, well, I don't want to level up the rogues. I don't want to have to gear them. It takes too much time. And I respect that. And that's perfectly fine. But these days it really really genuinely doesn't take that much time to level up the rogues. Each rogue, depending on the level of the contracts that you do, takes maybe five to seven contracts now to go from level one starting all the way up to max level. Now there are a couple different ways that you can get these rogues leveled up. You can do them through contracts, you can do them through blueprints, but obtaining these can be a little tough for some people early on because you just need a random variety of mostly useless contracts. Now you can either gather these while mapping. Um, smuggler's chests are pretty nice just for basic currency and such while you're leveling up and going through maps and such. You could take some of these heist nodes on the tree. There's quite a variety of them. Just get a decent amount of contracts of any various kind. You can also take the seventh gate as well as all of these gateway nodes that would allow you to put heist on your map device, which is going to give you two additional smugglers caches. So you could gather a bunch that way. Another alternative is that if you are leveling a new character or you're going to level up, say like a, uh, a random Deadeye or 
uh, Pathfinder to swap into this heist character. As you level up, every time you level, the contracts that Wakano has will reset. You can just buy his whole inventory, level up, buy his whole inventory, and do that as you level up, and then you'll have all the contracts that you need to be able to level every single one of the rogues. The last option that you could also do is you could come here to the bulk heist willing to sell uh, tab on the Forbidden Trove, find somebody who's just selling a bunch of bulk contracts, buy however many they're selling, like 100 or 200 at a time. This will be more expensive, but it is an option to just get a whole giant bulk of contracts, run all of them, and then maybe you could even resell them off if you wanted to after you're done. The next step is going to be gearing the rogues. The gear on each of these rogues is actually relatively important, particularly on Gianna if you are going to be doing contracts with her, because mainly the contract that you're going to be doing are deception contracts, and Gianna is the best for this because she gets reveals and she's the best at deception. So a lot of people can find the process of gearing up these rogues extremely tedious, and I do agree with you to a point. It can be expensive because people don't really sell these base items. However, there is sort of a way that you can get around this. What I suggest that you do is you go to the trade website, you buy a large amount of whatever it is, the type of item that you're attempting to roll. Say you're wanting to roll fully at brooches. You'll go into a random tab. Like let's say we want to go to this tab here, right? I've, I've even got some here that I can show you. You would go here and on these kinds of items, we're typically trying to roll plus one to heists, right? There is a modifier on these weapons that can roll that will give your rogue every single plus heist job, right? You can take your alterations, which are extremely cheap, and just go through them in a line like this until you find the mod that you're looking for. This can either be like hiring speed, it could be plus one to level of all jobs, it could be some random various ones that you need on your foliate brooches, like um, reduced hiring fee, duplicate base currency, whatever it might be. But if you roll a lot of these at one time, it makes it so that you can roll through them faster, meaning you don't have to worry about like rolling over whatever mod that you're trying to get. And it allows you to roll them for multiple rogues at the same time. Being able to do this without having to worry about rolling over the modifier with a large variety of bases is going to make it significantly easier to roll all of the gear for all of these rogues. Now, talking about the types of gear that all the rogues need, it depends on the strategy that you're doing, and later in the strategy portions of this video, I will give you specifics on each of the rogues and what you should be looking for. Now, as just for some general tips, if you're running heist and you want to do things more quickly, you want to make more currency per hour, you want to be more efficient, the number one piece of advice that I can give you is that you really do need to try to do as much as you possibly can in bulk. What I mean by that is that when you are buying things like deception contracts, if I can spell it properly, you should be buying these in massive bulk, just as many as you possibly can at any given time, right? Buy these in bulk, roll them in bulk, meaning that if you are worried about mods like say, uh, no regen, right? These mods that have no region on them, get rid of all of them in bulk. Type in region and use scours and get rid of all of them at once. You can move them all into just a, a random giant dump tab and get all the mods off of them. Run these in bulk. Sell all the items that you get from whatever you are running in bulk. You are going to spend significantly less time if you sell all of your items to one person randomly in bulk, whether that makes you more or less, because you're only gonna spend that maybe like one or two minutes selling a whole bunch of stuff instead of spending 30 or 40 minutes doing like one individual trade here and there. The next thing when it comes to running heist and being safe is that you are going to want to make sure that you do everything that you can as fast as you can without dying. So for example, if we go ahead and just run a normal heist here, this will be a Gianna deception contract. You saw that it had no region, so I scoured it. You would have an entire inventory filled with these contracts and you'd run them over and over and over. But when you get into this contract, the main thing that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go into the options here under UI and look for map transparency. This is pretty important. You want this base map transparency up as high as you can get and the land landscape transparency up as high as really you can manage just so you can see the doors. The main thing that matters is being able to see these yellow markers on the doors, but you want this map transparency all the way up. The main reason for this is that you are most of the time going to be following your little X on the dot, trying to figure out where you're going. The reason you want that yellow transparency to be up high enough is so that you know exactly when you're running into a door so that you can move through that door quickly and not have to worry about, you know, like 
fumbling and pressing a whole bunch of buttons. Because when you start doing Berserk and everything else, you're going to be moving insanely fast through these areas, right? You're going to want to optimize this as best you can. Because if you double the amount of time that it takes you to be able to run a single contract, that is essentially cutting your profits realistically in half. You want to be able to run through these areas with nothing stopping you as fast as humanly possible. Whatever that means for you, do whatever makes it most efficient. That means things like staying to the side in trap layouts and making sure that you're using things like Berserk and making sure it's up constantly, using Molten Shell if you think you're gonna take a bunch of damage. And a lot of people get you know, caught on just opening up little chests and things like that, but realistically, the little random chests are only worth it if a rogue is doing their job and trying to open a door or something. Other than that, focus on the big rewards like big chest rooms or things like if you're doing the finalized strategy, just the rewards at the end of the blueprint. One other thing that you can do to optimize the way that you're running these is try to get into a bit of a routine. This can be as simple as just running all of the same type of blueprints at a time. So say if you're running all laboratories in a row, you're going to be a little bit better adapted like muscle memory wise to running those laboratories. You'll get used to the layouts, you'll get used to how many doors and such that there are at any given time. If you run all of those together, you'll go a little bit faster. Same as if you're in like a blueprint and there are typically four doors in a blueprint, start at the same cardinal direction every time and go around clockwise. Just make it so that you don't have any extra thinking that you need to do at any given time. Now this ties into the rest of what I was saying before, but one big thing when it comes to making money with heist is that small optimizations tend to matter a decent amount. So when you are doing things, as I said previously, you'll want to do them in bulk. That includes things like revealing wings on blueprints. You'll want to do these all at one time, right? So if you're going to go with the strategy where you're revealing wings, you're gonna to wanna to get an entire inventory of these blueprints, reveal them all in one sitting. And then after you've revealed all of them in one sitting, you're gonna go into the planning room with all of your blueprints, you're gonna pop these in, and you're gonna fill in the rogues all at the same time. So you'll fill out all these rogues. And then once you've got them all filled out, you'll hit confirm plans, take this out, put in the next one, and continue putting in rogues. So the idea here is that since you are doing all of this in bulk, it's massively reducing the amount of time that you would take to walk back and forth between different areas, right? If every single time that you went into the Rogue's Harbor, did a blueprint, and then you had to go and you had to reveal all the rooms for it, then you had to come walk down into here and then assign all of the rogues, that's time walking back and forth that you're losing. That's minutes, hours that you're losing over the course of time. Do everything in bulk. Absolutely everything in bulk. The next thing I'm going to show you is going to be an example blueprint. We will use one of these that I've got here, and I'll show you a little bit about how these are ran. So this is going to be a four wing blueprint, so I'll show you what I mean by keeping things in routine and being as optimal as you possibly can. So when I run into any blueprint, the very first direction that I go is top left at all times. I go to top left and then I move around clockwise so that if say I get distracted in real life or I have to do something, I know that if I've exited a blueprint and I'm standing here, when I come back, it's like, okay, so I did this one and I need to move to this one next. But the whole idea here is getting through these as quickly as you possibly can. Don't open any extra chests unless one of the rogues is doing their job and just move through, ignoring pretty much everything, opening the doors. See, here's Gianna doing something. I'll open a chest just because there's nothing else to do. We'll move through, run all the way to the end, and then we get to these blueprint rewards here. So when you get to these final rewards here, realistically, in my mind, the only time that you are ever going to take something is going to be if it is worth 15 chaos or more. Otherwise, it does not make sense to lock down the heist and lose out on the time it would take to exit for a very small amount of currency. So for example, there would be nothing that I would take here, right? There's nothing really worthwhile here. However, to give you an example, I'm gonna take this exalted orb so I can show you a few things. Now, when we exit, it can happen where the rogue is going to be taking damage from all of these various enemies whenever you're trying to exit the heist, right? There's a couple different ways that you can deal with this. One is that you're going to tank them yourself with Enduring Cry. As you saw, all of the enemies started attacking me and the door just started opening. Another thing that you can do is you can cover the rogue with these frost walls like this. We're perma-phasing, so it doesn't actually do anything to us. 
and that prevents like projectiles and enemies from getting nearby. And lastly, you can drop these decoy totems that we have here, which will also taunt enemies, keep their attention while the rogue does their job. These different tools are what we use to make it so that the rogues can open the doors and we don't need to do any damage. So now I'm going to do one more wing of this heist here, just so I can show you exactly what it would look like if I'm trying to do this at full speed. Uh, as long as I don't get hit by any doors or make any mistakes here. So we're just going to wait for the rogue to open the door, move through here as quickly as we can. Sometimes these little environments are going to be kind of annoying to move through at high speed, so you'll get better at this over time. We'll go in. This thief's trinket doesn't have any good mods on it. Replica dream feather is not worth anything. Replica badge is actually worth a decent amount. It is at least worth picking up. Nothing here. This isn't a six link and nothing there. So we'll go ahead and take replica badge. That is worth taking and we will move out of the heist. So we'll tank. Try to make sure that she doesn't have anything on her while we're killing stuff. Get caught on a wall as per usual. And just try to exit as quickly as humanly possible. So that's the idea. Replica badge isn't worth that much. It's about one divine at the moment, which is about kind of standard for heist rewards at this point. This is about the lowest amount of stuff that you want to take is like a, a big stack of chaos is okay. A divine is good, all those kinds of things. But you will just churn through these different heist blueprints depending on which strategy that you're doing taking the big item that's at the end and getting out now another example would be if you're running a blueprint where you care about the rewards on the side this is going to be strategy number two you're going to be moving through here and i will move my camera so that you can see a little bit better but you'll see this alert level here that's at the bottom right this alert level goes up whenever you do open chests. So if you're moving through these heists and you're going to be opening up various rooms, you need to be aware that the different rogues have different modifiers that's going to make it so that some chests give you a ton of alert level bonus, some give you almost none, but you do have to be careful not to open up too many of these. Now, there is one particular thing that you can do with opening these up, right? Say like divination cards and essences and other things are decent at the moment, right? What you can do is you can run all the way to the end here and you can see, well, since I'm opening doors anyways, we can go check to see what the end item is. And if the end item does end up being bad, hopefully it's bad here, most of the time it's bad. So we'll see if I just randomly get some really good item. Uh, we got some stuff that I would normally take, right? However, it's nothing insane. It's basically just a stack of chaos. So say that we don't want anything from here. What you would do is you would exit the heist and you would just pick up whatever random chests or like doors and open the doors and grab those chests and such. And you would essentially just not worry about the alert level anymore, right? You don't care about, you know, getting the final item. So you'll just keep opening chests over and over and over and over again until the alarm goes off. And even after the alarm goes off, you can keep... You have like 30 plus seconds to open up more and more and more chests. It just reduces the amount of time that you have. And then you can exit the heist with all of that extra loot. So then once you finish the heist, the blueprint, whatever it is that you're doing, you'll exit, go back to the rogues harbor. And then if you're doing everything correctly and running it in bulk, you should be able to take these blueprints that we've already got ready and already done everything for, walk up to Adia, go to prepare grand heist, pop it in here and just hit begin. And then you don't have to do any extra walking, any extra anything, you're just ready to just knock out as many blueprints as basically you can afford at one time. Next thing is that I do want to quickly talk about the sources of your money. The number one source of your money is always going to be from these bases. These are just insane amounts of money that you're going to be able to get from this. If you look at this item, 392 is what it says the base is worth. However, 0 0.6, 0 0.8 of a mirror, one mirror for some of these, right? However, the thing about all of these items is that these are all split bases. Every single one that you're going to find on the trade website is going to have a split tag on it. That means that even though these are 0.6 of a mirror, this item right here is worth two of those because you can split it yourself. So take whatever price you see for whatever base that you see here and double it off of whatever is available, right? So if this ring here is worth one divine, all of these are going to be split as long as a split beast is worth less than a divine, of course, and it's going to be worth two of those. Micro distillery belts, the base for these item level 86 is 3.5 to four divine. You're going to double that because you'll split it. That is always going to be the main giant sources of your currency. Beyond that, some of the more consistent currency is going to be raw divines, raw chaos orbs, these tempering orbs and tailoring orbs, 
all of these drop extremely consistently. However, depending on the strategy that you're doing, it might just only barely make you a little bit of extra profit based on how much you're investing into the maps. Now, beyond that, there are a few other things that will happen significantly less often. You can find good replicas sometimes. There are a few replicas that are worth money. You can also find things like winged scarabs. You can find things like rogues trinkets, which if these do have one of the good mods on them, like regal orbs drop is divine, However, it does need to be specifically the highest tier, which this isn't, so this is only worth roughly one divine. But you can find lots of these different items that end up being worth a pretty decent amount of money. You'll want to just consistently keep an eye on things like Ninja, and you'll kind of get an idea in your head as you go through which replicas are worth money. And eventually, you won't have to check anything anymore, you'll just be able to look at it at a glance. Now, do be aware that sometimes there are going to be items that can drop that may be worth a little bit more. Like if you get, say, a six link of a good base that's a good eye level that maybe has some kind of really good heist implicit already on it, maybe that will sell for something, but that's going to be a lot harder to tell, and I can't give you any specific, like, information on that. Next thing is we are going to talk about this dedicated heist build. Pretty much the only content that this build can realistically do is heist, or if there's other content that requires you to kill zero enemies at any given time, build could probably do that as well. It focuses on two things, going fast and staying alive. For going fast, the main way that we're accomplishing this is going to be just stacking as much movement speed as we realistically can on our gear through things like Queen of the Forest, Peripatia, um, boots with decent movement speed on them, a very powerful Quicksilver flask, as well as a bunch of flask effects. But beyond that, the main way is going to be things like Phase Run as well as Berserk. Phase Run scales movement speed with both gym level as well as quality, so we do have this not all the way leveled up, I've just been leveling them as I do heist because you kill a few mobs here, but we do have it linked with Enhance, so this does give us a ton of movement speed. When we do have this enabled, it is giving us an absolute ridiculous amount. The other thing that we are using is going to be Berserk. When we activate Berserk, Berserk is going to give us significantly more movement speed, and you'll see that when I get Phase Run here, we're running at like 550, 600% movement speed. So this is very, very fast. Now, how are we maintaining Berserk? The main way is going to be through Chain Breaker here. Because we don't need to cast any abilities, really, we don't need to attack, we don't need to do anything, this skills cost plus three rage essentially does nothing. So we scale as much mana regen as we possibly can, as much of it as we can get on gear, on implicits, on um, like we run a clarity aura wherever it is here. Yeah, clarity aura. We've got it on jewels, all kinds of stuff. We get simply as much mana regen as we can reasonably get to scale. I think the build gets up to like 17, maybe 19 rage per second. It's quite a bit. So that's how we move fast. How do we stay alive? We essentially just take every reasonable defensive layer we possibly can. Now, we are a Pathfinder, and that does mean that we're going to invest pretty heavily into being able to have perma flasks. You might notice if you're paying attention down to the left of me that my flasks are pretty much always up no matter what. This is going to be something that you can see in Path of Building, which I'll go ahead and open it here right now. There are like full notes on how to craft and get all of these specific items, but there is going to be a section here if I can find it specifically about the flasks. If you go into Path of Building and you look at these flasks here, you'll notice that on the right there it says flask uptime 100%. If you do not see flask uptime 100% on every single one of these flasks, you will most likely die and you will most likely have issues being able to maintain all of your flasks. We do that through things like belt stuff like reduced flash charge is used, increased flask effect duration, increased flash charge is gained. We have like chance to not consume charges on our flasks. We have like increased effect of flasks. All kinds of stuff on our tree is basically just dedicated to having these flasks up 100% of the time. Beyond that, we're getting armor, we're getting evasion, we're getting spell suppression, we're getting recoup, we're getting life. We're just getting as many things as we possibly can to make us go fast and to not die. So you might notice one peculiar thing here about the ascendancy tree and that we don't have a fourth ascendancy. It's because none of these really do anything for us. They don't do anything meaningful. So we are taking small points instead because it just ends up being more worthwhile. And then for our other ascendancy, we are going to be using the primalist because charms are pretty strong and having an additional backpack here is pretty nice. For these charms, you only really need to worry about the main features on these, which is going to be effective onslaught. Movement speed cannot be modified to below base value. This makes it so that you're immune to things like stun. 
and then also banner skills have no reservation you do want these three particularly the banner skills have no reservation is necessary the other mods on these just get whatever you can get recover life when you use a flask might get expensive um increased life regeneration rate could get expensive these are the ones that i've chosen the other modifier doesn't matter that much now notably we do have one issue here in that Typically, you need to use mana to cast your abilities, and we have no way to recover mana with Chainbreaker. Mana recovery from generation regeneration doesn't work. That's the main way that you would do it. So we are going to be using Eldritch Battery. This does just essentially make it so that we cast all of our abilities off of our energy shield, which we have a little bit that we're getting from our shield here. You can get it from other pieces as well. And this just makes it very, very, very simple to cast all of your abilities and not really worry too much. Now, in the previous section, I explained most of the abilities, but I'll go over them very briefly here. I've already talked about phase run as well as berserk. We do use decoy totems to protect the rogue sometimes. We also use frost walls to protect the rogue sometimes. This makes it so that enemies can't really like walk through here or cast projectiles or such. We do have molten shell. There are going to be times when you have to run through trapped areas. You can completely ignore the traps, hit Molten Shell, and as long as you've got Berserk up, you should be able to run those trap sections, no problem. You can also heal yourself with Enduring Cry, but this is mainly going to be for taunting enemies to keep them off your rogues. We do have a movement skill, Frost Blank. I almost never use this because it interrupts your phase run, but if for some reason you need to jump a gap or get over something, having Frost Blank is pretty useful. And then we run a bunch of auras. We've got Determination, Purity of Elements for Resistances, as well as Im Immunity to Elemental Ailments. Defiance Banner is giving us a little bit of protection from crit and some armor and evasion we've got vitality for recovery grace for evade haste so that we can move faster and clarity to give us more rage now this build uses some pretty unique gear and we'll go through it quickly so we use ichimanji the main reason for this is that the mana reservation efficiency of skills this is pretty much like a unique mod to this weapon there's not very many other ones that have something like this we are also going to be using peripatia mainly because this gives you movement speed as well as it has the possibility of having implicits that give you like mana regeneration or life gain on block or anything else that you want to get in that regard we are using defiance of destiny this does make it so that we're essentially immune to small hits and increased mana regeneration rate is just kind of good for the build in general it's got some life it's got some resistances just an overall really solid amulet for the build massive upgrade that this was put into the game Notably, you do want to quality it, especially more than I've quality it. I just stopped dying, so I stopped worrying about investing any more money into the build. Life and mana quality is very important here. For the helmet, you do need to make sure that you get at least 18% mana reservation efficiency of skills total here, meaning that between the implicit and the essence modifier on here, which there are crafting notes for all of this gear down in the, um, in the POB that's in the description, without 18%, you're not going to be able to use all of your auras. You do need at least 18% between the essence and the implicit. But this is just some very simple crafted gear that just has like life and chaos resist. The belt is relatively straightforward to craft. You just get a fractured reduced flash shard is used or fractured increased flask effect duration and roll the other one with literally anything. Boots. You just want to get the implicits, some life, some movement speed. We do use Queen of the Forest with a bunch of evasion, which means that we get the full 75% increased movement speed here. The rings, this is one thing that could get pretty expensive are these synthesized ring bases. Get as best of mana regeneration rate as you can. If you can't get synthesized mana regeneration rate, it doesn't matter that much. Get as high of a life amount fractured as you possibly can on just some decent rings and then roll them with essences and you're pretty much good. Flasks, every single one of our flasks is using increased effect and reduced duration. And then we've got movement speed, additional elemental resistances, armor, curse effect, and evasion as our five suffixes. When it comes to jewels on the tree, our normal jewels that we're using are just going to be life as well as mana regeneration rate, any other good mods you can get. We are of course using a lethal pride so that we can get chain breaker. We're using a watcher's eye with chance to evade hits while affected by grace. This helps us cap out our evasion. We are using a a single cluster jewel we needed some of the flask effect duration to keep our flask going all the time once again i already kind of talked about the charms during the ascendancy that is pretty much it when it comes to the jewels the next thing we're going to talk about are the three separate strategies that you can use for heist that i think personally end up being worthwhile the first one is just going to be running deception contracts with Gianna and selling all of the results. So the main reason that deception contracts are good, I kind of showed them to you before. We'll go ahead and run one here. We go into any deception contract. Um, these modifiers, it's reduced flash charges gained, which can be a little bit annoying. It's doable, but... Um, it can be a little bit annoying. Hello. The main money that you're going to make from a deception contract is going to be from the side rooms as well as the final result. So if you're doing this particularly to make money, 
the main things that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to open up these side rooms that have any divination cards in them. Of course, I get one that doesn't have any divination cards in it, but you're going to want to move through here, focus on prioritizing those side rooms that have the divination cards in them. Of course, there's none in the one that I wanted to show. However, the only other room that I would say is even somewhat worthwhile in here is probably going to be Harbinger Room, so I'll go ahead and open one of these here. There is a bit of currency that can be pretty decent from these, but the vast majority of the time it's not going to be great, and I don't think picking up portions of a Chaos is really too super worthwhile. Uh, some of the very high tier currency is worth a lot of money, so you can go for that if you want to. But otherwise, most of the time, you're just going to be getting these results of like some Orbs of Horizon and some Regal Shards or Chaos Shards or things like that. But you'll run through, you'll open up any of these little lockers that you feel like you want to, to open. I'll show you what happens if the alert goes off, because you can have the alert go off, even go into it a little bit and still be able to get all the way to the end and open this final chest. As long as you make sure that you don't take too much time, you'll grab this final item and you'll run out with it. That is the basis of how you run these when you're running them for money. Most of the time, these contracts will actually have good wings in them. Like they'll have, uh, you know, like divination card results, which is going to be the vast majority of your money, those stacked decks. But then you'll come out, run a bunch of these in bulk, and then sell all those final items that you get. And those will give you, as you can see here, a bunch of these coins from Faustus. So these coins are basically like a big portion of your money as well. If you look at chaos, it's about one chaos to 300 of these coins. And out of the, I think I sold like seven runs there, we got 11,600. And 11,600 divided by uh, 300 is roughly 40 chaos. So out of those, you got 40 chaos basically just from the rogues markers themselves. So when you combine this as well as the stacked decks, that's where most of your profit is going to come from. That is strategy number one. Now this kind of ties into strategy number two, and that's going to be full running blueprints. Now, one other big bonus that you get from running deception contracts particularly, besides the fact that they are just the fastest contracts to run, as you saw, I was able to just run immediately out. They have some of the best rewards that are possible. When you come over here to Wakano and reveal blueprints, you'll notice that you can use this arrow over here to go to Gianna. And if Gianna has a plus one, uh, item on her, this goes up to a 45% discount. This discount is massive because compared to Wakano, if we reveal like a random room here, this is 1,711 coins to reveal one room. That's almost not worth it a lot of the time. However, with Gianna, it's 1,027, quite a bit cheaper. Now, before we get into strategy two, let's talk about the gear that you would want on Gianna. The main thing that you're going to need on her is you're going to need a foliate brooch that has heist chance, have a chance to duplicate contained basic currency. Stacked decks are basic currency. And then you're going to want something that says increased rogues marker value of primary heist target. These two modifiers together are extremely important because it's going to give you a multiplier on how much currency that you're getting per deception contract that you run. Besides that, you can just get good modifiers on your like cloak and on your weapon, just things that are gonna give you like reduced hiring fee or make you move faster, things like that. And then on the main item that you've got here, her regicide disguise kit, you're going to want to make sure that while you are running the contracts, you have chance on completing a heist to generate an additional reveal with Wakano, as well as some like additional speed of doing the job. These two modifiers are super important. You can swap to a plus one uh, item here for Gianna whenever you're doing blueprints, but you really need that chance on completing a heist to generate additional reveal with Wakano if you're going to be revealing blueprints later. Once you've figured out how to do deception contracts and you've ran through all of these, you've gotten your reveals, maybe you've even maxed out like Wakano or Gianna reveals. The next step is going to be coming over to Wakano and getting your blueprints ready. This strategy is going to be full clearing blueprints. Now, it is pretty important that you understand margins and how your profit is going to be generated when you do something like this. What you have to do in general is you have to account for the fact that this stacked deck room, right, or divination card room costs 1700 coins. Currently, the price of coins in bulk is like 300 ish per chaos right so 1700 divided by 300 is going to be 5.6 so you need to ask yourself if you are revealing with wakano and you are spending 5.6 chaos to open this room are you going to make at least 5.6 chaos on average over time from the room that you're revealing for divination cards most of the time yes for currency rooms 
Uh, maybe, probably not though. And then it's just going to kind of vary depending on what current market prices are. Like for example, there's decent potential that you could make more than 5.6 chaos from an essence room. There's potential that you could make more than 5.6 chaos from a harbinger room. But on average, a lot of the time, it's pretty much only really these divination card rooms that are going to give you guaranteed very high profit. So if we were to do this blueprint, the idea would be is that we would use Gianna reveals on mainly the wings. You would want to save the Gianna reveals for wings. Wings are a lot more expensive, so you would always want to use her for them. And then when it came to doing the small rooms, you probably just use Wakano. All of the divination card rooms you would reveal for sure, those are pretty much always going to be worth it, especially if you have a bunch of rogues with chance to duplicate or if you have like Vendiri in there. So if you've got like close to 100% chance to duplicate these items, you're going to get a lot of currency. You could get 10 to 15 stacked decks sometimes if you get really lucky out of one of these divination card rooms, which ends up giving you like 30, maybe 40 chaos worth of worth of like money for just one room. So do a little bit of research, check PoE Ninja, see what the prices are compared from rogues currency to the profits that you're going to get from any particular kind of room. Beyond that, everything else is pretty much same for running the blueprints. As I said in the previous portion of the video, reveal them in bulk, assign the ro rogues in bulk, run them in bulk. This time, you're just going to be opening a bunch more rooms compared to just ignoring everything like we will in the next strategy. Now, what this means is that the gear for your rogues as well as your thief trinket is going to be a little bit different. If you are going to be opening rooms, particularly ones that can drop any amount of chaos or regals, meaning those currency rooms, you will probably want a good trinket that will give you um, conversion. Now, these can be very, very expensive. In my opinion, the way that you go about this is that when you start, if you have a bunch of money, buy this trinket when you begin running heist, and as soon as you're done with heist, sell it back and just be done with it and use it as just a tool for a certain period of time. Most of the other conversion trinkets are really genuinely not worth it, and I think the only other mod that's actually somewhat worthwhile is going to be chance to receive an additional divination card item whenever you open a chest. That's pretty much it. Now beyond that for here, on pretty much all of the gear, the modifiers that you're looking for are reduced hiring fee. Reduced hiring fee in general is going to massively reduce the amount of coins that you need to spend on hiring the rogues for these blueprints which is actually a pretty significant amount. In general, this can reduce the hiring fee from like 1,700 to 2,000 per blueprint down to like maybe 13 to 15. You're saving multiple chaos per blueprint that you run just for rolling some hiring fee on a couple pieces of gear. Beyond that, job speed is always good on pretty much anything that you can get it. Just get job speed on any item that it is available for. Now, particularly on the brooches, you are going to want high chance have a chance to duplicate contained basic currency on essentially every single rogue if you are going to be opening those kinds of chests. Now there is potential for you to optimize this. So say for example, if you are running engineering in some of the blueprints that you're doing and essences are worth a decent amount, you will pretty much always have Isla whenever you are doing engineering. So you could give her brooch chance to duplicate essences if you wanted to, that's an option. However, in my mind, in general, I feel it's just gonna be better to have all of them duplicate currency, probably at the end of the day going to be the best option. When it comes to cloaks for this strategy, you really are going to want to get as much chance to not generate alert level as well as reduced alert level generated on pretty much all of the cloaks. The chance to not activate lockdown and grand heist is useful later, but if you're gonna be opening various chests, you wanna have reduction of alert level on pretty much every single cloak on every single rogue. For the main gear that you're going to be using, you just want to have plus one to level of all jobs if the rogue does have multiple jobs. Say, for example, right now, um, Nanette is kind of bugged, and I hope that this will be fixed sometime relatively soon, so I'm not going to go too deep into it. But Nanette is currently a little bit bugged in that she can crash the game pretty frequently. So if you give Karst a plus one level of all jobs a lockpick here, he can do up to level four perception, which means you only need to use Nanette for level five perception jobs. Otherwise, if it's someone like Talina that can only do agility, her item can have just plus one agility and that's more than fine. Now, let's talk about the final strategy. This is the most high-end one. This is the one that I do personally whenever I'm running heist. This has the most variance and it is the least likely to pay out consistently. This strategy is taking these blueprints and doing absolutely nothing with them. You reveal the wings and you just go. There's even one step further that you can take on this strategy where you just buy absolutely insane bulk of blueprints 
and only run one wing and don't reveal any of the extra wings. You don't run contracts. You don't gather a bunch of rogues markers. You just run one ring wing of the blueprint and you just churn through as many blueprints as you possibly can get. Determining which of these two strategies you want to do, whether it is running deception contracts, buying the coins and unveiling all of the different wings, or just buying one wing revealed blueprints and just churning through them, really depends on what is going to be available in the market. The problem that you're going to run into here is that buying bulk blueprints, if a bunch of people start doing this, the supply of these is just going to disappear, right? So there's only so many that are available at any given time. So you can buy these bulk blueprints and just run one wing of them and have it, you know, just churn through a whole bunch at any given time. Because on average, if we're looking at the price of blueprints here for say like, um, I level 83 plus 30 chaos each for random blueprints, you could probably make money off of that. Because if every like five or six wings that you're running through, you get a one div item that's essentially paid for everything and eventually you will find those big ones. You don't have to worry about deception stuff. You don't have to worry about anything extra. You just churn through a whole bunch of them. However, if a bunch of people start doing that same exact thing and it just eats up all the blueprints that even exist, the price of blueprints is going to go up. And then on top of that, the just raw volume will not be able to supply the demand. So do keep that in mind as I talk about the rest of the strategy. So method one, when it comes to this strategy, you're going to be running deception contracts, buying them in bulk, running with Gianna, revealing all of the wings and only the wings, and then speed running through every single blueprint. Strategy two, skipping all of that, buying one wing blueprints and just running the one wing blueprints. And that's pretty much it. The main thing that you need to know about this strategy is that the investment cost at the start is going to be very high. You should have like, 30 to 50 just raw fluid currency that you can just lose before you even begin doing this. For the most part, you're going to maintain the amount of currency that you've got, but you're not going to make large amounts of currency until you hit these bigger items. At the end of the day, this does end up being the most currency per hour once you do hit those big items, but you're going to need quite a bit to be able to make the, the strategy work at a glance. With this, you're going to need slightly different stuff on your rogues, however. For your cloaks, you're mainly going to want to get this chance to not activate lockdown and grand heists on every single one of your rogues. That means that if there are two good items that you can get from one set, you'll be able to pick both of them. Like, for example, I've had a case where there is a six div item and a five div item and you know having a 15 percent ish chance to get both of those seems pretty good in the long run you're just going to want plus one level of all jobs on all of your rogues you're going to want reduced hiring fee on pretty much any piece of gear that you can possibly get it job speed is also nice that's pretty much all you're worried about that chance to not activate lockdown and grand heist as much reduction of hiring costs as you possibly can get and then job speed and job levels and that is going to be it for the video remember that the divination that you make per hour, the currency that you make per hour will vary wildly with heist. There's not really any way for me to give you an exact number because it depends on how lucky you get, if I'm being honest with you. But this guide should have covered basically all of the realistic strategies that you can use, how to set up the dedicated heist build and all that kind of good stuff. If you do want to see examples of this build in action, I do have a live stream that you can find in the live stream section of my channel where I did a hundred blueprints all back to back to back to back. If you want to see like some of the variety of loot that you can get as well as like how the process goes and how it feels throughout the entire thing. So remember boys, if you enjoy this content, make sure to give this video a like, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit that notification bell to stay up to date with all the latest videos and stay safe out there in Ray class. And I'll see you guys in the next video.